morning. It's a privilege being here this morning. Um, thanks, Dion, for the invite. Can you guys hear me at the back properly there? Is there something wrong with this section of the chairs? <laughs> so, um, like Dion said, my name's Ian. I, um, I'm the Project Management Office Executive at Jet, uh, Jet Stores. Uh, we all know Jet, right? It's the value retail apparel, um, clothing retail apparel uh, chain in South Africa. So we have, uh, we have over 500 stores across Southern Africa. Um, it's a 10 billion rand business. But I'm not here to represent Jet this morning. Um, I'm here in my personal capacity. A lot of my presentation is around um, not so much industry-specific um, project management role and a project management office role. All right, so we'll jump ahead. The, the structure for today is, to, is really four sections, right? It's really just an overview of a PMO. I'm not sure how much exposure um, the guys in the room have had with what a, what a PMO is. I think there's a lot of interpretations around um, what a PMO really is and what it can and can't do. So we'll talk through that. Um, the types of PMO, where it's best fit, and what are the trade-offs for different types of PMOs. And then uh, strategy development is, is part of the presentation. Um, and I'll explain why uh, later, but strategy development is something I think every project manager should be aware of and exposed to. Um, the world is moving ahead with uh, project management is changing really. It's not just the technical knowledge that you have to have anymore. You have to understand how that fits into strategy and how things work in the organization. So that's important. Very short piece though, only four slides on uh, strategy development. Uh, and then we'll get into the actual implementation of strategy. And there I'll give some, some views of, of how we do things internally in, in JET as well. Um, and we'll, we'll talk about OPM, which is uh, Organizational Project Management. And then um, the last section is just to understand, you know what, if, you, if you're going to create a PMO, if you don't have one, there are some lessons to, to learn of how to create the PMO. Um, I've been doing that for the last year or so, and I'm still doing it. So it's not, a, it's not an easy process, it's, it's quite long. And then what I've done as well is just put some gold nuggets into the presentation for you. Now, my interpretation of a gold nugget is, is something that I think might be of value to you. Uh, you're probably not going to read that in a lot of books. I think those are more the real life experiences that I've had, which it helps if you can avoid those or apply those as well. You won't have to make the same mistakes as everybody else. And I guess that is the principle of uh, the PM Bach and the PM, PMI guides that you know, they've developed things that I've, other people have learned so that you don't have to um, make the same kind of mistakes. So, so when you see those in the slides, I'll just talk a bit through how it applies in, in practice in, in JET or in our PMO. All right. So a PMO is defined really as a business unit that, um, that supports strategic alliance and delivers business... Uh, value through, through project management, right? So that a PMO, if you'll find that in any definition, really it comes down to that, where PMO is a, a structure in a business unit that aligns projects and um, supports project managers in the business, right? And we'll talk more through that. A lot of the theories and the, the keywords you might find if you, if you, if you uh, think of PMOs or, you know, PMO will provide tools and techniques on how to do um, uh, how do we, how do we implement project management in the business? It's a repository for information. They provide templates. How many how many people actually work in, with the PMO in this in the room? So, so you you might have um, well, I don't know how many people are PMOs. Not so you might have some some negative connotations about PMOs. These are people that keep you busy. They make sure they they force you to do uh, extra reporting. Uh, they force you to fill out certain templates and work in a certain structured way. 
So, so I understand sometimes a PMO not, might be just an authority that kind of, uh, you know, makes you do things and regulates the way you work, right? So there are, there are some areas in these uh, um, PMO structures that are probably not uh, the most uh, favorable thing you think about when you, when you think of a PMO, right or wrong. But I think um, <clears throat> every organization really has to define what a PMO does and, and what it's used for, for that business, right? Um, we, we, I looked at it, we, we um, did, did research on these. You cannot copy a PMO from one business to the next because it doesn't work. There's no um, standard structure out there that you just take whatever you've read and think and uh, formulate about PMO and you, and you move it into another business because it, it doesn't work that way. So the, the entire presentation will, will work that through. But uh, it's a good question. I think in layman's terms, there's a, it's, it's a business unit in, in an organization, right? That business unit's focus is to support project managers in the business. They support them with all those keywords of tools and techniques, yes, governance, yes, a template, do it this way. On the next slide or two, we'll, we'll, we'll discuss further exactly more detail about what the different kinds of PMOs are to answer your question. Okay. All right, so we understand a PMO is whatever a business decides it is. It's not a cut and paste, um, cookie cutter concept from one business to the next. IT has a different structure of PMOs. Engineering has different structures. Right now, the PMO that I look after is actually a more retail fit. So let's talk about um, the different PMOs. You guys all read this in um, PMI material that there's, there's three types of PMOs, right? You guys are aware of this by now. Um, supportive, directive, and controlling. The, um, the real description then for a supportive PMO is, I call that the entry-level PMO. All right, it's a, it's a no frills PMO. It, it doesn't monitor anything. It doesn't provide any measurement for you. Um, you've got a directive PMO, which I call more the dashboard PMO, which they will, they will produce dashboards to uh, monitor uh, progress on different projects. Um, and they apply moderate control in the business, right? The controlling PMO really manages projects directly. Um, and they take a systems approach, an organizational approach to project management. Some of these elements you might find overlap, so it's not as clear as what it's on the it's on the uh, on the slide either. You don't there's no line that ends here and then the next supportive starts and another, you know, then the directive starts. It's kind of a mix of both, but if you had to roughly classify different PMOs, you probably find that they are. You can you can group certain activities into those um, those different PMOs. Just that I'm getting <laughs> to that. <laughs> so let me start off by saying I'll probably position it somewhere. Yeah. The one that we the one that I'm working in is is somewhere. Yeah. To me, supportive PMO. You know, no offense if anybody's in that situation, but um, it's, it's a lot of admin. It's a lot of run around to, to be a, a supportive PMO. Especially, I mean, if you, if, you, if, you have, if you work at an executive level, you don't want to work in a supportive PMO, me personally, because you don't really have any strategic value there. You're not, you're not influencing business. You're almost just creating a, a template for someone to follow, and there you go. But we'll talk through that. I mean, it's, it's important that, that you understand the different concepts of what it's used for. So really, the purpose of a supportive PMO is to establish those basic standards. They provide methodologies and, and templates on how to manage projects, right, in the organization. 
the directive uh, PMO would probably monitor your project. Uh, they might give you input into areas of concern or um, opportunities to improve those projects. Sorry, by the way, guys, you're welcome to have this presentation when I'm done. So um, I'm sure Dion will supply it to you when, I, when I'm done. So then, again, the controlling PMO establishes those organizational project management um, a framework for, for managing uh, organizational projects. <laughs> and it is very much an integration approach to project management, right? And it, it, it will work at a strategic level. The best fit for a supportive PMO, my opinion, uh, from what I've seen, is a supportive PMO is effective where, where project managers are almost self-managed, right? Um, where, they, where they have a lot of knowledge, a lot of experience. So you don't need another layer of management to try and manage project managers that are already experienced and have the knowledge. All you might need is a, a standard protocol of how things should be working in the business. Make sense? Um, a directive PMO, to me, is more where the, the organization has a fragmented way of managing projects. So um, the directive PMO might assist in monitoring and controlling everything that's happening in that PMO. But projects are usually fragmented. They're not really related to each other. There's no real integration. That is probably where a directive PMO is the best, best fit for you. On the controlling side, a controlling PMO, um, I think it probably works better where it's a functional matrix organization and where you have um, that balanced matrix uh, structure, right? You guys understand what that is? I mean, I'm sure you've done some of this work. But to me, where, where, the, where the business manager is very functional, um, it's probably the best fit for a, a, a controlling PMO. And again, the strategic value is where you really find being more of a directive PMO. Uh, the value there for supportive, again, introduces consistency, and it has some consultative support does provide some consultative support. Um, directive, I think it helps a lot where directive PMO uh, monitors and, and um, highlights areas. It does help to provide that success when, you, when you're doing re repetitive action. And um, it provides that platform where people can work within a, a framework where there's almost repetitive success in, in doing projects. So perhaps in certain industries where, where, there, where there's a lot of um, regulation around how things are done, maybe like engineering, directive PMO um, is a place to go. How many, um, is anybody in engineering? Oh, there we go. Um, and they really drive compliance for project managers to do certain things. So the controlling PMO actually establishes that OPM framework and it allows the functions to operate and focus on business as usual activities, right? Where, um, where, they, where they almost don't have to run projects themselves. There is a body, there's a controlling um, PMO structure in place that, that runs projects and functional managers can focus on doing their um, business, as usual, more efficiently. Right, are there any questions around which kind of PMOs there are? So let's look at trade-offs then. So if you have a supportive uh, or a directive or a controlling PMO, there's, there's, there's good things and then there's things you've got to consider you have to live with almost. There's trade-offs to that. So in the supportive PMO, Standards don't always mean there's compliance accountability, right? So you might have a standard that somebody has to follow, but if there's no measurement, no monitoring, you know, you can't guarantee that there's accountability out there. Um, and again, there's no real, in my opinion, my view, there's no real strategic value for, for a um, supportive PMO. And then directive. Because of all the reporting and the uh, compliance, 
I think there's there's probably just an extra layer of, of management reporting in that in that PMO, which does complicate things because um, project managers are usually reporting progress to a PMO, and that PMO aggregates things and reports that to another layer of um, management. So it just adds more complexity, more time and effort to roll up reports, aggregate information, and then you know you're almost just handing that information off to higher levels in the business. Uh, again, I don't think there's a lot of strategic value there, but it may be a little bit more than um, the support of PMO. And then the trade-off, I think, for a, um, a controlling PMO that, that runs OPM, it's pretty expensive, right? Because you've got a, you, gotta, you, you have an extra layer or an extra cost center that you have to look after. There's a lot of uh, time and money to be spent on building it up. Uh, so it is, you have to consider the fact that it is more expensive than, than most of the other PMOs. And then the, the, the time frame it takes to get to maturity is, is quite long. Like I said, I've been um, also doing this for more than a year, trying to put OPM and, and this kind of uh, PMO in place. So you have to, you have to consider it's quite a long-term investment. Okay. Clear enough? So... When we, uh, when we look at EDCON, I just wanted to show you um, how our PMO fits into the organizational structure. So, so what we have is a, almost like a holding company, right? Is everybody familiar with EDCON? I mean, it's quite a big business in uh, South Africa. So EDCON is the holding company. And within that, there are uh, different business functions under EDCON, right? So you all know CNA, uh, you know Edgars and Jet. Now CNA, Edgars and Jet are almost like the operating divisions of EDCON. EDCON works a lot on uh, a um, federated model. So EDCON manages the, the corporate affairs of the business and then the different uh, organizational or the different operating divisions have their own separate functions, but they do share uh, corporate services like IT and financial services, and they do share um, similar sourcing and supply chain, which is then run outside of the, the actual chain, all right? So within, um, within JET then, there are different functional um, heads, so finance, HR, Store ops and marketing. So, any guess where the PMO sits in those? Finance, ops. Oh, there you go, get the prize. So, in strategy, um, and I always say something about strategy if it's everybody's responsibility, then nobody really does it, right? So, strategy has its own head in. in um, in, in JET and, and in Edgars. It's a functional um, management unit that runs in that, in, separate in the business. And that, um, that person heads up strategy and within strategy there's, there's two units, right? There's an there's a insights piece and then that's our PMO where, where we operate from. The insights really are to build up strategic um, to look at, to have a strategic view on things and to offer the business, these are your alternatives for strategy. On the PMO side, it's really about taking those that are approved and then making sure it's implemented properly in the business. Okay, any questions around the, the structures in JET? Is it clear enough? Yeah, yeah absolutely. So it's a full-time job. I mean, there's, uh, in that department, there are four, four people that actually just keep on building and analyzing, looking what's happening in the market. How many supply chain divisions in the business market? How many supply chain divisions in the business market? This structure or those, that yes. federated model? Yeah, the jet strategy, uh, the great jet structure. Oh, the jet structure. Um, 
so the strategy piece has been there for probably over two or three years, right? What we've realized was that there was a gap between strategy and execution because we had a lot of programs, a lot of projects, a lot of initiatives that we, we found useful and we wanted to do. And um, the, the time horizon for a lot of our projects, especially in retail, I think a lot of other retailers, is that because you work with a financial year, your time horizon is almost one year because of your, because your money cycle works in a year. And a lot of those projects you couldn't fit in one year. And you know, through implementation, a lot of them actually fell off because you know, how do you prioritize these kind of things if you only have a very short time to implement them? And then we realized we, we probably need another um, business unit that can focus on implementing those strategies. Because they do, these strategies do range across most of the functional units as well. So that's pretty recent. And like I said, it's a year and a half now that we've been putting this together. Um, but strategy and this structure has been in, in JET for maybe three years. Previously in JET, these, um, <coughs> these business units would report, these, these functional um, levels would be a, a higher higher. Up. So all those functional levels used to be sitting under EDCON. And then JET was just a brand along with CNA. But you had one head of operations under, EDCAS, uh, under EDCON, one head of uh, um, HR. And we decided to federate that. And every, all the functional uh, heads move under the, the chain itself. So, so EDCAS has their own structure, maybe a bit different. Um, and CNA has their own structures. And that chief executive reports through to the, um, the CEO. So the, the levels are pretty flat, and, and the functions are, are working within each brand. But JET doesn't have an IT system of their own. They, they obviously share that, because there are some, some areas that you can um, benefit from scale. All right. So, so, the, so the PMO, I think the illustration here is the PMO doesn't filter much further. They aren't way lower down levels of control. Uh, just wanted to find out, uh, with regards to insights in the PMO, uh, how is it different from an organization having a research and development unit, which has also operations, of which uh, whatever strategy or research that has been conducted is implemented by the so for us, these insights are not so much, um, uh, if I understand research and de development, that, that is building an, a capability on selling a new product, right? So we, you know, because it's fashion, we, we, the insights department really understands it. It's always scanning the horizon for, and every year they renew the strategy. And then that comes from the insights area. Now, obviously, they take a lot of... Um, they read a lot from what's happening inside the business as well. But also, the, they, there's, a, there's a, a longer time horizon for them. So they'd look five or ten years ahead to say, you know, this is where the market's moving. And it takes a lot of data to analyze those kind of things. A lot of time. Um, and you really need a dedicated team of people that actually are doing that. Like I said earlier, you know, if you leave that to operations, um, if you leave that to an operations person, which their jobs are, are to understand, make things efficient to what they're doing in that, in that area, they're not always going to scan the horizon and understand what's the next five years look like for, for the business, right? So, so for R&D, yes, a lot of these, a lot of this, and, and, and you'll, you'll see through the presentation, a lot of these activities, are, they, don't, uh, they don't function on their own. You know what I mean? So it's not, it's not PMO and insights that are doing things and running with it alone. Um, it's really things to support all of these functional areas, right? So, so whatever, whatever decisions and implementation comes from that, it gets handed off. It gets handed off to one of these uh, functional areas to operate. And I'll explain a bit later my view on uh, that business as usual concept and then... Um, really what, what are the projects about. Is it clear enough? There was another question. Um, I think you 
people address it as we move on, I'm specifically interested in how you bridge that gap between a strategist that you only come out from from a non-operational area, and we sit down to research your strategy and how you actually get it implemented in that gap. Uh, because often you'll find a strategy is not always implemented or a difficulty um, if you don't sufficiently uh, consult with the operational area, but I'm sure you'll address it just more. If I don't, then please call me out. But yes, I, I think I have tried to try to make that link. Um, was there anything else before we move on? Should I talk about the, the actual PMO structure we have so you can understand how that works? So <coughs> my official title really in the business is PMO and New Business Development, right? So they, they kind of they kind of made it a double barrel um, title there. Office. Office. I'm not a PMO actually. PMO is the, <laughs> the actual business unit. So, I, you know, I, I, I shouldn't be calling myself a PMO because cause I'm not a PMO. <laughs> it's just easy. I mean, you know what, things in corporate as well, everybody loves acronyms. And you just kind of go with it, you know. Where's the PMO? And then... <laughs> <laughs> so, there are lots of acronyms. and But it does... Um, yeah, some people call it a portfolio management office. A projects management office, there's a, you know, it depends again what you want to call it, but it's the O is office. Um, so within within the PMO structure, there are there are really five project management uh, project managers and whoops, and these um, this area of the business, there might be six or seven, and then they they kind of get contracted in and you get more people in. But really, there's two sections of uh, the the PMO. There's the almost like the, the permanent structure, which are two project managers. One, um, one side of them really looks at analyzing, reporting, measuring things, making sure there's you know, projects on track. And then I've got another project management, a project manager that really looks at integration in, across the business, across the projects, and also planning. All right, and we'll talk a bit more about how they do those things. On the new business development side, there are almost contracted project managers, right? So if we, if we have a new initiative we want to um, roll out in the business and you need a specific set of skills, uh, those will be the people that actually run those projects and it could be for six months or a year. You know, they'll, they'll run a project for us, I'll hand it over to business and they'll move on to the next one or we'll, we'll rotate them with other specialists. Perspective, do you appoint people as qualified project managers or do you take people from business and sort of teach yeah. them how you, wanna, yeah. how you want stuff to be done? It's a, it's a good question because I was speaking to somebody the other day, and you know, when you look at our business, we're all retailers first, right? So everybody in the business is a retailer. Yeah, you, know, you might be working in IT and you might be. You might be buying, you might be running a store, but you, you know we're all retailers. So the way we've approached it is to understand, okay, the skill set required, yeah, is somebody that really understands business process management, and they really understand how to use the system because there's a lot of um, there's a lot of systems we use. You know, you need an advanced person that can do Excel, yeah, for example. Somebody that spends time on reporting and building and monitoring is not somebody that has never uh, worked on Excel, or well, they can't use it at a very advanced level because it would take them weeks to do things where a person like that might take a morning to put an entire project uh, monitoring together. <coughs> so we we really structured it here with um, people that have been working on projects, but maybe it was a planner, and we moved them in here to do that kind of monitoring. So it's the skills we required for that job set, um, and we and we source those inside the business. This person is actually um, an operations person that has operations history. So, and you know that that was a good fit for for them. But what we're doing with um, 
with all three of those project managers really passing them through and making sure they have a PMP. So there is very there is formal training. There's a lot invested in in those uh, in that team of people that they have to have a qualified they have to be qualified in what they're doing. They have to understand how the process works. So these project managers on this side really are, like I said, they're specialists depending on um, what project's important and and we source them in and out of the business to to implement those projects. And then again, these, uh, these guys on the left, they would look after, not run, but they would um, be involved in multiple projects, but they won't overlap as much, right? So they also do reporting, but they'll support different projects as well. So we won't have, we won't have both project managers on a single project. They'd, they'd, they'd have their own grouping of projects that they, that they facilitate. Any questions around how it's structured? Oh, yes, okay. Do you, do, you, do you service everything from IT to HR projects? Yeah. To everything? Yeah, I wanted to mention that we, we, um, <coughs> well, let me just go back one, yeah. Finance doesn't really have a lot of projects, right? It's very uh, regimental in the way they do it. And finance, for example, takes a lot of lead from uh, corporate on how things are done. Um, HR, there are projects that we, get involved in, in HR, um, but we probably don't lead those projects because those are more for the specialized people in HR, but where it has a strategic um, um, impact on the business, then definitely that's an area that we'd be involved in. A lot of our projects are in, and, and sorry, in merchandise and buying, there are one or two areas that we are, we are involved in, but the bulk of our projects are uh, the really still in store operations. Where we where we will build and manage something for store operations and hand it over to them. Um, I'd love to tell you exactly what I'm talking about, but there's some proprietary uh, interests that I should look after as well. But there are uh, new areas that we're um, exploring into, and those will be handed over to operations. So so some of these um, projects go through almost like an incubation stage, where it's the project is really separated from the business as usual, totally separated in this area. And um, once it's working, we have the formula right, it'll be handed over to people that can run it on a daily basis. Okay. <clears throat> so we'll talk a bit about uh, strategy development now. There's really only four slides, but you have to have a, you have to have a view on on developing strategy, right? Um, like I said earlier, I think times are moving on now, and you, you'd, you'd find that project management, like it, it's probably different in the past because going forward, you, you'd have to have some knowledge about understanding strategy, right? It's not so much the benefits of understanding and implementing technical projects or doing them technically. It's understanding how it fits in the strategy of the business. So if you've read Jim Collins, a good book to read, good to great. He has three questions that a business should ask themselves, right? When they develop their strategies, what are they really passionate about in the business? Um, what, what can they be best at in the world? Right? These are questions that senior people in the business should be asking themselves. And then what is the real, uh, what drives that economic engine, you know? What is the real value in, in doing this kind of business? And how do we, how do we sustain that kind of stuff in the, in the market? The, um, the real question is, if, if your people aren't passionate about what you're doing, um, they're probably not going to support it, right? Or they'll lose interest very quickly. The, um, the organization also has to ask themselves, what are they best at doing because if you're not doing something that you can do the best in the world then the the competition is really gonna catch you very quickly and then that economic engine is um, 
obviously what, what kind of business you really, um, what's going to work for you, and what's really driving the value of the business. So th that is the, um, that's the, the hedgehog model if you've, if you've read the book and understand this. Where, where these three spheres overlap is, is where you're going to probably find what you're going to, the one thing that you're going to be very good at as a business. So to explain the hedgehog model, there's the fox and the hedgehog. I don't know, you guys, some of you might have read the book, but the hedgehog has one strategy to survive, and that's to roll up in a ball when, it, when it's threatened, right? Where a fox tries the different tricks to catch the hedgehog. So the fox has many different ways of trying to do things, but by far the hedgehog is more successful than the fox because... The hedgehog knows how to do one thing right, that's roll up in a ball and protect itself. And that's really what uh, Jim Collins is speaking about in the, in the hedgehog model. So those three questions, um, it's quite imperative for a business to ask themselves. Of course, there are many other models um, to apply when you, when you develop your strategy. You know, this is just one that I thought might be good and easy to explain, but it illustrates the point that uh, you have to find what you're best at doing in the world. So, the next thing I move on is actually um, because it's a, a project management uh, uh, flavor is what the PMI describes as these five uh, development uh, strategy development attributes, right? Establishing change imperative, let's make sure that people understand that the business must move. Uh, and the only way to grow is to change and move on. Uh, define the market discipline, the value proposition. Uh, the third element is to understand the organizational context. Uh, to know what stakeholder management means in that strategy. And then to, start, uh, to understand what the competitor set is up to. So firstly, um, in establishing that change imperative you know, the, fir the first thing really to understand what the strategy is, is that there, there must be something that changes, right? There, there must be momentum to move the organization forward and create that sustainable competitive advantage. Um, and then it will look at your structures as they are now, uh, where you want to be, and then fitting and, and developing those structures to, to meet your strategy or your strategic intent. The second one is quite uh, interesting. It says define your discipline and value proposition. Now, there are really, uh, based on this, there are really three areas of value proposition that, that a business could look at. Three choices, right? The first one is customer intimacy, really, is that that's meeting the specific needs of a special group of people, right? Well, that's the value you're offering to the market. Or you're providing operational excellence where it's the best value of cost of ownership. Now, the drivers there are going to be um, quality, or, or the drivers really repeat business and loyalty for that. Uh, that's what you want to drive in your strategy. And that's the decision you take for, for that area. And then product leadership. Oh, by the way, I think the best example on a company that does that strategy is probably Amazon, because it also uh, looks at the... Um, how you place your product in that market and the accessibility that you give customers for that, for that area, for that strategy. And then product leadership <coughs> is maybe a company like Apple where you just focus a lot on technological, um, you know, the, the leading edge te technological advancement that you make. And that's the value you're offering uh, to, your, to your customers is that you always have the best and the most modern uh, product. So whatever, um, whatever company really decides, and there might be a mix of these as well. So it's not as clear cut to say, you know, either you're following a customer intimate strategy or operational excellence strategy. There's obviously a, a mix of a little bit of everything in, in business, but um, it, really, it really goes down to the company understanding what are they best at, what can they be best at. One of those three. They have to kind of choose and Make a decision that, you know, we, we're going to run with that strategy. Because in, in essence, strategy is really, um, you know, 
a choice between two equally attractive um, paths. If you if you do, if you're not if you don't have two options in front of you, um, and you and you have to make a strategic decision on which option you want to use, then it's not really a strategy, right? If you only have one option, you, and you and you have to and you have to do that in your business, then it's not really a strategy. It's more it's more like a um, either you're improving efficiency or uh, you don't have a, you don't have another choice. That might be a tactical plan. That, that that's the one thing that's that's only there's only one option to do this, and we have to go that way. So strategy is really always if unless there's two equally attractive options, and you have to make a choice, then then you know it's a strategy. Otherwise, it's just a you know we have to we have to um, keep trading, or the stores will close. I mean that's not a strategy. Okay, everybody got that understood. Um, the organizational content uh, context uh, is really how a business should be structuring itself to, to in that in that environment. And that's that's more like the geographical structure or the, the manufacturing capacity you have. You know, those are the, the strategic decisions you have to take to say this is the context of the environment, and that's how you're going to move forward. And then the stakeholder uh, management. And it's, it's not really what we think only as stakeholders, you know, it's, it's not just the customer that they're serving, it's also the employees that work in the business, who owns the business. Um, so you have to comprehend the full, full um, makeup of that structure of stakeholders around the business when you develop your strategy. Um, if you lose key insights on who's important to the strategy, who's the real role players and the stakeholders, you might end up losing access to certain markets if you don't look after certain relationships with, um, with stakeholders of the business, right? And then you have to factor for competition as well when you develop the strategy. Um, and it's not just your direct competitors that you think of. It could, could be indirect competitors or people that offer alternative or substitute products. And really understanding what's happening with competition and, and keeping in touch with the trends, because trends might, competition trends might move your, your uh, move away from your, where your strategic intent is, but the market's moving in a different direction. So it's, it's, it's imperative that you understand what is the competitor set for that strategy that you've chosen. All right? And that's it on strategy development. Uh, I really encourage you to research the topic a bit more understand what's best for the business, where you think, you know, where you think the, the best decisions can be made on a strategic level. Um, as people involved in project management and implementation, you cannot ignore, um, the, you cannot ignore what the str strategic intent of your business is because to be a to be a more effective project manager, you have to understand how the context of your projects work within an organization as well. It's pointless um, really doing a great project uh, or doing a, a project really well, and then halfway through it or, you, or at the end of it, you realize, well, the strategy is, you know, strategy has moved on, but I've implemented something quite perfect here. So it's no longer where you can say, that's my job. I do the project and I'm done. Um, you have to have the responsibility of understanding how that applies into the strategy of the business, right? So if nothing else, just un at least understand what the strategic intent of the business is as well. And sometimes it's difficult. Sometimes it's not really on paper that you can just read and say, um, yeah, um, I'm doing the right project, does align. You have to speak to people. You have to interact with those kind of decision makers. And quite honestly, if you don't know what the strate strategy is of the business, you, you have to find out. Well, you have to make sure people understand that, um, you know, if it's not clear enough, that they have to have a clear strategy. All right, so we'll look at. Uh, so, so Ian, well, how good are you guys at strategy? Because what you're saying is absolutely right. But people stuff up strategy so badly. They either, they either go on their board or on produce a document and never look at it for the next year. Yeah. Or they come up with 
find this guy that's unrealistic um, and then the obvious in the, the inability to execute whatever whatever they um, whatever they set up. So if you had to, to give us an insight into how good are you at setting clear mm. strategies with clear priorities and then executing. So I think and maybe adding to that your, your PMO yeah. has it made a change to where you were probably two, three years ago to where you now. Yeah. So I, I've, I've always believed, and I'm probably biased to say that our, our well, JET has a good strategy. Um, uh, and by the amount of work that goes in our strategy and the amount of discussion around it and the amount of input that, that our insights people give, I, I'm, you know, I look at those strategies and I say these are really, um, you know, it, it hits the mark because they do a lot of analysis around why these decisions should be taken. So it's, it's very data heavy, which is good because there's a lot of research behind the strategy. Um, so I'm confident with the strategy. I think it's, a, it's good. Um, from the implementation side, I think when, whenever they develop a strategy, there are, some, there are some areas that are pretty big, right? That are very, uh, you know, strategies are quite, quite big, so they have to move the business a lot, so they are quite scary when you say there are some strategies that are quick wins and there are some strategies that are really difficult to implement because it might change the structure of the business, you know. Uh, so they, they are, they're not, you, we can't always say that the, the strategy we developed is perfectly to implement, right, because that's not, you know, otherwise a lot of project managers wouldn't be there. If, if strategy was just so simple that you could take it and give it to functional people and say, okay, that's, that's what you're doing this year, and you know, you'll see them again next year and make sure it's done. I think the, the reason we have projects and, pro and portfolios in a business is to understand um, what it's going to take to move from business as usual now, to follow the strategy, and, they, and then you have a new, new business as usual. So, yes, there are areas that uh, are very difficult to implement, but there are, on the whole, I think we... You know, it's a moving target. But on the whole, we've got decent structures to get these things done and, and put them in place. But it does take a lot of uh, money and time. So it's not easy for any business, I, I'm assuming. Can you elaborate specifically on that? That integration, that gap that I was speaking about earlier, how do you do that? You're a strategist you outside of operations. You've got to involve the operational people before you formalize and finalize a specific strategy. They've got very long hours, very long days. Mm. How, when do you do this consultation and, 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 and that process? Just take us briefly through engaging them full time so Sorry. that you, they don't end up with a strategy that is not implemented or leave it up to them to sort out. So really what, what and I'll talk you through the process. So what happens is that the insights, the insights area constantly scan and develop strategy, right? The way our structures work is that um, every six weeks, there's an there's a executive strategy session, all right? So those, all, the, all the 10 executives in, in JET would go, go away and spend the day and, and talk strategy, all right? From, from those discussions, um, which is also not easy discussions because, you know, it's, it's not like our chief executive sits in front of us and says, you know, that's the strategy and that's what we're going to do. And I don't think it works a lot like that in a lot of businesses. You know, these, these, uh, these views you have that a leader would stand up in front of somebody and said, you know, we, we're doing this next year. And then there's, you know, then everybody follows that because it doesn't work like that with us. It's a... It's a very, that's why we have these sessions, these strategic sessions, so um, it's interactive, operations people are there, marketing people, finance, everybody sits in the room and discusses where we are and what we want to do and where we want to be. Those uh, sessions are not concluded unless everybody really agrees, well you've, you've given enough input from all the functions to say, okay, that's how it's going to look. Because they'll, they'll never walk away from one of those sessions to say, you know, we've got some agreement, 
We've got some plans that, that we can put in place, so let's do what we can. Those sessions are really designed to say, to mold it and, and shape it in a way that everybody's committed to understanding and how, it, how it should be uh, or what it should look like. Then, so in between those weeks, um, there's an implementation plan that happened, right? There are steer codes for the major projects that we do. Not every project has a steer code. Because steer codes are um, they're time consuming, right? And there's a, there's a lot of other things that still have to happen as in the business that, that carry on. So, so we, we have, we'll identify maybe five of the top strategic projects. And they'd almost have a weekly steer curve. Where the same people that sat in the, in the uh, strategy development sessions would also sit in those steer curves. And people like me would, would report on progress and update them on how these projects are running. And what the, what the risks are. And, um, you know, what the chances of success are. And like I said, because we have to do it so frequently because our, our time horizon on those kind of strategies are very short. So there is a lot of, um, you know, it's, it's not a case of just the insights uh, area just sitting and doing a strategy and handing it over to the next, uh, to the next cycle because it doesn't work that way. Create accountability right from the top for the strategy. Yeah. So there's alignment with strategic objectives, how you measure them, which projects will drive those measures, yeah. and, and there's ownership along those lines. Yeah. And it's so you keep the connection between the strategy right down to implementation if I hear you correct. Yeah. Because that's that's what, what typically happens is it's planned here but it's executed here and there's a disconnect yeah. between. And I've also raised that further in the presentation that there's um, that is very important that those people work together. It's not, a, it's not a case of doing something and throwing it over to the next guy to implement. And the interesting thing is with these sessions that um, the, if, if you disagree with that strategy, you, you, it's almost like your peers, if they agree, they have to convince you that it's right. And then um, it, it won't end until everybody really understands and is committed to it. It's a good, it's a good thing, I think. It's, it helps for a lot of debate. Um, I'm interested to know um, in these sessions that you're talking about, uh, resonating from what Dion said, uh, uh, Dion said earlier, that you, whether you, um, you know, from your PMO office, how many people are actually, like, how many managers are actually from project managing professions, and how many are actually from the operational? I'd like to know what is the ratio of the people in that mix? In, my, in, in our yeah. PMO itself? Yeah. Uh, all, again, they're all retailers. Um, but the ones that are the uh, permanent positions, they, they have gone through uh, PMP qualification. So yes, they were retailers. And yes, they did a lot of other positions in the business, but um, you know, it's, for me, it was difficult to say, okay, let's, let's bring in um, somebody that's completely new to the industry and doesn't understand how the inner workings of this organi organization work. I can't say that for sure. Yeah. You know, if you have a master's degree in project management, you probably your chances are you're going to do well, right? And the chances are you've, you've developed uh, far enough in your career and in your, in your mindset that you could apply yourself pretty much to a lot of um, industries. The PMI talks about domain knowledge, right? And I think that's really what I'm saying is you have to have domain knowledge, or do, domain experience, to be very effective in that. Even the PMI says if you... If you've been appointed in a project and you don't have the main knowledge, the first thing you must do is put your hand up and say, I don't know how that industry works. It's your decision if you still want me to work there or not. So does that answer your question? I think a lot of, it, a lot of what we do is retail. And Let's tie it back to the question whether your project makes economical sense and 
when you start, I think a lot of that comes from the operational side um, instead of the academic side of the um, project management. I think a lot of that question can be tied back to whether you have these kind of expertise in your team mm. or not. So, from so really what we talked about here is really two things, right? There's the development piece and there's the implementation piece. The development piece, you don't necessarily have to be a, a master's in project management to participate in strategy development. But you have to be there. You have to have a seat at the table, you know what I mean? Um, from an implementation side, it helps if you know the technical um, aspects or the you know what are the what how do you win at implementation it's not a um, it's not a common knowledge area I mean you guys work in these environments right you people don't operate in a project management principle when they're running at full speed when there's um, yes you they all everybody plans and you know works professionally on things, but when, when the pressure's on, a lot of those principles go out the window. Hopefully, if you're a qualified project manager, you'd, you'd, have, you'd keep your wits about you to make sure that you follow the right principles. I think that, that, to me, is where I've seen the most value of having somebody that's really qualified in project management is when, it's not when um, things are smooth and easy, it's when things are really difficult a project management professional would be able to stick to the, the winning principles of implementing things. For a lot of other people that don't have experience, it really goes out the window. I don't know if you guys have seen that as well. So, I mean, that's why it is a profession. You know, project manager is a profession. You have to be a professional to do it. I hope that answers some of your questions. So, we've spoken about the structure of PMO. We've spoken a bit about um, what I view as different kind of PMOs. It's all in the PM box, by the way. I'm sure you've read that book uh, from the first page to the last page. All 670 pages of it. Who's done that? Who's done that? Really? Can you tell me what it's about? Um, Okay, but, but I mean, that, a lot of those theories are actually in the peer box, right? Um, we've spoken a bit about understanding that project managers need to have strategic value. And uh, we spoke a bit about being involved and understanding the strategy is important, right? You're not going to get away in your career in the future to operate in a silo, and think that you can just do projects well, and then they don't align to your strategy. Um, there are lots of strategic development frameworks out there. There are plenty, right? I mean, Dion must train a lot on those things as well. There are books and books written about this stuff. Um, but but if, you, if you're not familiar with it, it's not a very difficult concept, right? But you have to put your mind into it and understand what is what is it what does it take really to develop a strategy. I'm no expert, um, but if you understand how things work, it's not that difficult. You don't need to be a special creature to develop uh, a strategy. Just do research. Just understand what it's about, and then understand how you connect it to all that as a as a project manager or Whatever, um, whatever they call you in your business, right? So now we're moving on to say, okay, well, we've got the, uh, we've got a strategy. Now we need to under start understanding how do we, um, how do we vet those strategies? How do we start implementing them? And where I think we start first is really the business case. Now a lot of this is um, also from the theory of, of what a business case and the PMI gives you these kind of theories and um, so we'll talk about the business case and what it should contain right and I use this in our business as well it's very useful 
So firstly, there's four aspects of a business case. It's the need uh, that tells you why you're acting on something, right? What is the um, problem that you're trying to solve? It underlines uh, what is the scope of that uh, initiative. It, it defines really who the stakeholders are for that initiative. So that's the need that you're looking at. Then the uh, business case would also include, include how is that um, initiative aligned to the strategy. Again, I mean, there's a lot of talk about that. Uh, what is the root cause of the problem? What is the gap analysis? Uh, what are the risks and the key success factors for, um, for that initiative and how it aligns to strategy in the light? <laughs> the, uh, the another important thing of uh, business case, you have to also understand what are all the solutions around there. What, is, what are the other alternatives you can do, right? Um, it helps you not to get too focused on, on what, you, what that one initiative is. There might be other solutions around that to build a business case. What is the real recommendation? Um, what solution is going to be the best? Um, how are you going to measure that success? And how will you implement it? What are the, uh, the milestones to get there? And whose role is it really? Um, and who's responsible for that business case? The evaluation criteria is really how these uh, benefits will be measured. All right. And how those benefits are measured in our business is we run a feasibility. And I'll show you later where the feasibility is placed in the project life cycle. But what we use, and it's really um, an economic decision, right? Is there's, uh, there's the amount of money that has to go into this project or the initiative. There's a capital expense that must be spent on creating something new and of value, right? Um, you need to work out what the discounted cash flows are because you want to work out an IRR in the end. Um, and then there's that hurdle, that discount hurdle, um, which a lot of the a lot of you will know is almost like what is the expected IRR and it has to reach that hurdle for this to be feasible. The outputs to uh, feasibility are really that internal rate of return. Um, we set a certain target for all projects for internal rate of return varies from 30 to 50 percent. The EBITDA percentage is really what profit margin is it going to give you in the business. So what is this initiative going to contribute to profit? We set targets there as well for those. Um, the payback period is important because we, um, most of our projects, in fact, all of our operational projects have to have a payback period of less than five years. Um, break even is probably the first year. So the, there's, a, there's a lot of pressure on um, reaching the uh, the targeted returns for our projects. And then obviously it has to be um, NPV positive. But if you're hitting your hurdle rate, you're going to be NPV positive. But if it passes all of those um, measures, then it's feasible. In fact, that might be the first step just to do a rough feasibility and say, yes, this will work. Or, you know, it's, uh, it's a good idea, but it, it's, not a, it's not a feasible solution. Yeah. EBITDA. So earnings before interest, um, tax, amortization. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then uh, payback period is the amount of years it takes to get your money back on your investment. NPV is uh, net present value, which is really... Um, Okay, so the IRR is your rate of return. So and that's worked out by your discounted cash flow, and the year one investment is your capex. So year one is capex, which is outflow, and the discounted cash flows, or what's the, what's the cash profit expected from that initiative every year. But it, the discount hurdle is how you work out the discounted cash flows, because it's the time value of money because a million rand today is probably only worth 80, 800,000 in five years. So you can't say you're going to get a million rand a year. 
because your, your, your value of the money decreases. Did I get that right? Who's in finance? <laughs> Struggled through that one. Is, is that, are you good with that? All right. You'd find a lot of businesses probably use these kind of measures. It's not unique to JET, um, especially maybe a retailer. You know, banking would use probably different sets of uh, measures. But for us, really, it's an initiative that you create something. It costs you money to create, and it has to add value to your business. And that value is measured through how well it returns profits back into the business. And you must consider discounted cash flows and not, you know, it seems simple enough and not just think it's a linear um, value of money. Environment or not, etc. But is, is, that, is that a big thing for you guys? Yeah. Yeah. Because that's often where people miss the boat. The investment decision is, is then not yeah. taken seriously enough. Oh, it's way underestimated. And yeah. a big, big part of it is this capex piece. Because you might think, let's say you want to launch a new chain, and you work it out and you say, okay, each store will cost you X, systems will cost you this. So you do these rough estimates, and then I've seen it. A year down the line, that budget is double. And that IRR, it doesn't look so good, but you are so fully committed, you can't turn around. And I don't think that's unique to retailers. So yes, that's where most of the time goes into to say, um, and the discounted cash flows, but most of the time goes into estimating the cost of this project. You have to have that, um, uh, you have to have that roughly correct. What do they call it in uh, project manager? That rough order magnitude. You have to have, you have to have it close to eighty percent right. Although PM Bach describes it as um, between seventy percent, with minus seventy and plus twenty, which is hectic. Organization, where does the feasibility accountability sit? So you've got you've got a whole functional structure and then you've got the strategy portion of it and your project manager on that. Who actually does the feasibility? So the actual work around feasibility is um, a lot of my work and a lot of that goes into these estimates. Um, the the insights guy, I'm calling him that. Uh, they do. They they start with this feasibility because it's part of the strategy development piece, right? To say because you can't have a thousand ideas and they pie in the sky and really when it, you know, you've spent all that time and effort developing it and you realize there's no feasibility to it. The finance guy or department signs those things off, but the finance people are not the ones that are going to create it for you. You have to give them your uh, you have to almost negotiate with them to say this is what we believe is the best, uh, and then they'll they'll apply their financial uh, acumen to the feasibility. Another interesting thing, and I'll, I'll probably jump ahead a bit, is that this money doesn't belong to Jet either, right? Because because of our um, federated model, Edcon Corporate owns the cash, and they decide how much capex to release to their units. So it, it has to pass our internal um, feasibility, but we also have to present this almost to, to go and ask for money to, to the board. And it varies, obviously, on the different amounts of money you're asking for, but you know, if it's a million rand or less, they, you can decide yourself. And then you know, there's certain thresholds that go up to different business units in Edco. Build a set of assumptions about the value proposition, the market, the your ability to, um, to to procure through the supply chains, uh, uncertainty, exchange rate, all, all those other things. Um, so, do you have like a, a, a model? And obviously, your, your your insights team gathers information and data to back up it. So, do you have like a full model that? That these assumptions are then fit into? Yeah, we do. Um, so all of these feasibilities, actually there's a template that we use for feasibilities. And within that, there are hundreds of different lines of cost of credit, 
um, depreciation, cost of cost of working capital, the stock, and there are lots of measures that go in. You know, transport costs. There's a lot of um, there's a lot of other elements that really make up that feasibility, and it still has to hit that hurdle rate even after all of those. So we have a, a almost a standard financial view on if this initiative is going to go ahead. That's how much going to cost you. So a lot already goes in there, which is good for us because um, when when you go in front of the development committee and you ask for money, they're going to look at the same uh, measures that that you're looking at. So it's it's good that you don't have to have a different pitch for every single project you go to. There's certain uh, criteria that Edcon as a structure has agreed on. Those are where we invest money, and these are the things we must uh, account for. And then um, obviously it's just a a strategic discussion around whether those are the right projects or not. Yeah. So it's it's actually made pretty simple for us, but a lot of the costing work is not out there. You have to gather these things, you have to ask the right people, um, and you have to make some assumptions, yes. Yeah. Yeah, competition. That's right. Right. Um, but I'll, th I'll talk a bit more through that process a little bit later. Then there's, uh, after you have the feasibility, you might end up with 50 different projects, but you have to find out how you're going to prioritize these things, right? So these are some of the prioritization criteria that, that you can look at. And we, we use some of these, right? Um, financial impact, is it, is it easy to execute, um, is it low risk, is it high on the strategic agenda? So all of these aspects almost get weighted and ranked for every initiative, right? And every initiative ends up with a really a, like a score, a weighted average score. And what that happens, you plot that against this, um, this matrix. Everybody loves matrix. Um, you, you want to end up your projects that you execute in this quadrant, right? Because it's a high value impact and it's fairly easy to implement. What you never really want to do is implement projects that have got no business value or very little and they're very difficult to implement. So we avoid those as much as we can, um, but nothing's that clear cut, right? So, but this gives us a good view to say, you know what, these are all our 50 initiatives. How do we prioritize them? Easier, the easiest to implement with the biggest impact on the business gets um, priority for us. And this is not a once-off thing either. You're doing this, you're almost constantly doing this, right? As things shift and change and risks arise on one project and, you know, the market moves on a different way, it's not, it's not you don't do this and it's done for, for five years. This is a constant updating and reviewing of where these projects are ending up. And if they're really reaching their, um, their payback, right? Good tool to use. It's very useful. Um, the benefits management plan, you've heard of that. Um, it's a standard thing in, in project management. Um, it's a very good tool as well. It must contain what are the target benefits. So it's almost like a document that you, that you build and you manage that, through that document. It again tells you what, is the, what are the benefits targeted for this initiative or this project, right? It's not just the financial aspect, but it's also the intangible areas, like how it makes, you know, what value it adds to the way people are working, you know, what, what impact does it have on employee satisfaction, those kind of intangible things that are projects uh, that you can't always measure in a financial sense, right? How well that project is aligned really to your strategy again, a lot of talk about that. Um, what is the time frame to start seeing the return on these kind of projects? It has to be um, clearly stated that our projects will give us these return in, in these expected time frames. Um, and then really, uh, that project is the benefit owner. Now, the benefit owner is not always going to be a project manager, right? But a project manager has to make sure that this document is in place, managed, and, and updated. Benefit owners are usually the functional managers in your, in your business um, because your project is creating something of value for them. Um, so 
they have to really take ownership of realizing that value. Usually the sponsor, that sponsor is usually a, um, a functional executive or functional head. And then um, in that benefits management plan, you have to have a metrics to say, this is where we were, this is the stuff we've done, that's, the, that's where we are now. It's, it's the results, it's, measure, it's specific measure, measuring how things are benefited and how things um, have moved, what value this uh, project has added. Um, and then there's a funny one as well, it's kind of difficult to read, what, benef what risks are there to having this benefit? If you realize the benefit, what risks are there, right? Um, so a lot of these things are not really intuitive. Um, some of it is, you know, if you, if, you, if, you, if you benefit from a project that has improved um, efficiency in your business, you know, how does that affect the way people are working? And the risks to um, having a, a project that's improved efficiency, but now you might need less staff. You know, those are some risks that you, that you must face and understand with a benefits management plan. Any questions around that? That risk is so real. So is that consequences? It's kind of like the side effects of an antidote, yeah. But it's, it's good that you understand what they are because, um, you know, business is not that simple that things just work and get the benefits straight away and doesn't have any impact on the rest of the business. So this, this helps you look at and understand how that impacts and what are the risks, if any. Okay. Whoops. Now this is one of those gold nuggets I was talking about. Um, when you, in my, in my experience, that you always have to take a long-term view on what is a benefits management plan. Too often, I think, as project managers, um, you know, you, you'd, you'd complete your project and you'd hand it off to the business owner, right? Um, and it's almost like, uh, it's almost like you, you let it go and it's out of your system and it's finished. But, you know, six months down the line, whatever you've implemented, whatever you've created for them, they stop using. Or it's not hitting the returns because there might have been something that only came to fruition after you've handed it over. These things happen. I mean, these things do happen. Where, where it might now start to slow down the returns. And, um, you know, your, your name will come up as a project manager. Your name will come up to say, you know what, Ian gave me this, uh, you know, Ian put a store in this location, it didn't work. So you, you have to, it's not a case of, uh, you know, finish up and let go and never see it again. You've got to take a very long-term view on benefits realization uh, or benefits management plan. You know, it doesn't end when the project manager hands those things over. Always, always have a longer view of um, where your projects are and how they're progressing. <coughs> because like it says, your name, your name is still on that project management plan. All right. Does it resonate for anybody? All right. So implementing strategy, uh, you've got your initiatives, now you need to implement these things, right? So that is what Jack Walsh says. Um, it's probably not the best example now of um, former chief executive. Jack Walsh was uh, for General Electric, he was uh, the head of General Electric in the 80s, I think. But like I say, probably not the best one now because the GE fell off the Dow Jones a few months ago. They're not, they, they got kicked off the Dow Jones index. Interesting, this uh, General Electric was one of the companies that uh, formed the Dow Jones. Who knows the history of economics? They, they uh, formed Dow Jones with other like 50 or 60 other companies in the U.S. in the late 1800s. Yeah, and then they, uh, they've obviously lost so much value over the years that they, they got kicked off the Dow Jones. And more interesting is they were the last company to get kicked off. One of the founding companies. There are no more of those founding companies in the Dow Jones. 
Um, and it's probably got a lot to do with China as well, isn't it? But anyway, interesting fact. But he says, uh, choose the general direction and make sure you implement things. So, why start a project? Um, again, there's a lot of theory. There's theory heavy. It's, uh, it's to drive and manage change in the business, right? Otherwise, what's the need for a project? It has to change something. It has to drive and manage something different. Um, you need a compelling reason. You're going to find that in PM Box. These are the project initiation context categories. And like you see, implementing a strategy is, is one of those categories, right? And projects would deliver something of value that operations, and I don't mean operations in the sense of um, operations managers in stores, for example. The operations is all the functions in the business, how the business operates. Um, so projects will deliver something that operation needs. Um, another gold nugget there is that really I've seen projects um, being initiated by project managers and I've seen them being so heavily invested that they don't know when it was the right time to kill the project because if you as a project manager are, are thinking of projects and initiating them it's probably not a great idea because you're going to be so emotionally invested in those things and um, that you won't know when the right time is to exit out of projects. So, so always be cautious um, about getting too emotionally attached to a project. Um, it, it's, uh, it's, it's not worth initiating these things yourself as well. And definitely no, um, don't initiate any projects that are not uh, passed on to you because of some strategic importance. If you haven't uh, experienced that, I'm sure one day you'll remember. <laughs> uh, so let me talk again about business as usual. Retail, business, opera business as usual operations has, in my mind, three um, real important processes, right? You acquire a product, you distribute it, and you sell it. That's your current state, and that's how your business operates. If you're in uh, e-commerce, perhaps, that process might be switched around where sales happens uh, before distribution. It doesn't matter really, but I think those model, that process, is, a, is the basic process of a retailer, right? Acquiring, distributing, selling. If your strategy says that you must move from business as usual, which is a current state, into your desired future state, it's still going to be business as usual in the future state, right? you're doing it now and you you're operating and you you're managing the business um, but the strategy says I can move this direction now and that might mean new sales channels or this different distribution or uh, a new product development there's a lot of things that can affect the processes of, of retail uh, business as usual so what this really illustrates is that portfolio management um, projects programs don't fall within business as usual. It cannot. It should not. That is the vehicle that you use to change business as usual. So the intervention around um, projects and portfolios would really be to take business as usual from one point, implement a strategy, and, and deliver it to the next point, where the strategy is taking. Okay, so that's an important concept to understand. Um, projects are not designed to be business as usual because it's, it's an endeavor you take that's got an end date. And it has to hand over to somebody, it has to create some kind of value for the person that's going to use it. Right? If you, as a project manager, are working in business as usual, um, <coughs> you know, it's, it's going to be diffi difficult to separate yourself to say this is the end of the project, that's where the value is derived and I'm handing it over to somebody that can use it. So that just illustrates what, uh, um, where portfolio and projects operate. The, uh, the other thing really is, is a very simple uh, view on what are projects, programs, portfolios. I'm sure you guys are um, very familiar with this, but I think it's a good foundation to understand um, that projects uh, form uh, or programs 
are formed by a group of projects, right? And a portfolio is really a group of programs, all right? And programs are a grouping of similar projects, and a portfolio is a grouping of projects or programs that might not have anything in com common. So that's where all the real work is done. Um, and, it's, and it really tells you how to reach your goal, how to implement something, right? Where a program is also um, pretty useless unless you have more than one project. So you can't manage a program if you only have one project, because that's a project. Um, and you, you, know, you also have a portfolio that really tells you um, how or what goals should be achieved. So the, the point is, you, you know, if you say that projects belong to programs and programs belong to portfolios, you know, why not just call a portfolio a mega, a mega program, right? Because you, 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 can, you can say a program is this, but a bigger, better program is a portfolio, so why not just call it a mega program? And the answer really is um, programs and projects tell you how um, how to reach your goal, but a portfolio tells you what is the, what is the goal to be reached, right? So there's a simple definition between um, doing the right things and doing things right. In projects, you're doing things right. In portfolios, you're doing the right project. All right, so that explains a little bit where portfolios fit into the, into the um, strategy implementation. And really, as a PMO, this is, this is where you add value in portfolios. Um, yes, in projects and programs, but the real focus and attention is around managing portfolios. All right. Well, it, my, in the PMO, I think, all the projects that are strategic of value are in the PMO's uh, sphere. Now, there are different kinds of projects, you guys will know. I mean, there's, and, and by the way, we're not the only people, we haven't, we don't own the franchise of projects in Edcon or Jet, right? There are lots of other departments that have project managers um, that implement projects and they do it well. But we, we, we haven't cornered the market on owning everything in, in JET to say that we do all projects. How a PMO selects their projects should really only be the ones that are of strategic value, right? It's not to say that other projects are not important. It's just that we, we can't have a strategic effect on projects that are initiated within a functional environment. And those projects might be to improve efficiency in that function. Um, and it, it, uh, it really doesn't have a company-wide or organization-wide view on the strategic intent of the business. Okay. So let's talk about organizational project management. That's, uh, that's really what we're getting into. You guys have heard the term. You understand what it is, but I'll talk you through it. So an organization environment consists of projects, programs, strategy, operations, all of these things are in the organizational environment. Managing the interactions between all of those is where organizational project management happens. Right? It's really understanding there are different parts of the business. The organization is made up of many different factors. Managing or understanding how those interactions work with each other is where OPM um, happens, right? So now we're talking about aligning projects with strategy, right? So Dinsmore is a, um, I mean, you guys heard of Dinsmore, I'm sure. He's a uh, international authority on project management and organizational change, right? So he's, he's provided the world with a checklist of questions that senior people should be asking themselves um, on how to align their strategies and projects. The first one really, is the organization committed to using 
project management strategically? And I think there's a couple of questions in there. Um, it's a decision a company has to make to say we're going to use PM strategically to implement strategy and change, right? In, in past years, you had layers of management that a, a, a strategy change would filter down layers and eventually would reach the, reach the frontline staff and they'd probably have a different view of what was said and how, what really the strategy is. It's, it's, I can see it, and I mean, I'm living proof that implementation of strategy is really moving into a project management environment. That has to be a commitment that companies make or businesses make, not only for uh, more effectiveness, but also so that middle management supports it, right? Because middle management is really where all the work gets done. If your senior executives might support the theory of implementing strategy with projects, but if the middle management don't um, buy into it, you'll never get anything done. So it has to be a commitment that the business makes to using PM. The um, other question or the checklist really is, and it's a pretty simple one, but you'll, you'll be surprised how many people miss this, right? Is, is there a formal way or is there a formal process of implementing charters in the business? Um, they, 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 we never, we didn't have charters. Yes, our IT uh, development guys had charters, but you know, in, in JET, I'd never seen a charter for a project. We've introduced those kind of aspects now. But it means that everybody, all senior execs must be committed to building a charter and having a charter to implement a strategy or implement a, pro a project supporting a strategy. And um, yeah, I think I might have it in here. What, what aspects do you need to look at in a charter? But a project charter is an absolute essential thing to have if you're going to implement OPM in your business. It's not easy for retailers to start thinking uh, project manager-wise because if you tell, a, if you tell somebody, implement, um, implement this project charter, you know, people don't want to spend the time and understand how to build these things if they don't have project management experience. So it takes a lot of work. Um, and this is what we spoke about a bit earlier, is that is there synergy between the business groups responsible for thinking up strategy and those that are implementing strategy? Usually not the same person, and I said again, it shouldn't be because of that emotional investment you have in, in projects, you shouldn't be initiating it. No, 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 it's all right. It's horrible where that screensaver doesn't want to unlock. <laughs> you just can't get your password in there. All right, so this is the hand grenade syndrome that I, that I spoke about earlier. So you have a bunch of guys imp or thinking up strategy here. They take that and they throw it over the wall, and then you, you as project manager has to catch this and then suddenly start implementing. So um, from an OPM perspective, senior people have to understand that these two groups of um, implementers and people that think up strategy have to work together. And they have to be involved in creating a strategy because if you don't have a, somebody that's implementing projects involved with creating them, there's going to be a big mismatch, right? So as far as you can, try and be involved or at least get a seat at the table to, to be involved in strategy development. It's not easy. You have to. And then the last thing is how can senior management really um, make sure that projects are not deviating from that charter? Now, one way we do it is from those strategic reviews we have very often, we have steer codes, we take time out maybe um, you know, in certain periods, you just take the, the whole day or the, two days and you review and analyze every project that you're doing at a senior level, from an exco level. Um, and that's the kind of involvement that there is and commitment there is that our exco's functional people would be sitting in um, project review meetings. Very useful because you're almost auditing your own work, right? You're making sure it's still aligned with strategy, um, that you, t you take time out of your normal schedule and you're looking and making sure that these projects are still aligned and they're progressing. And that's how you do these things. And then uh, we spoke about charters. 
when you, um, as a project management manager, it says you probably shouldn't be the guy that does the project charter, right? You read that. No, it's, it's true. I mean, as, you, as a PM, you're expecting your sponsor to come to you and say, there's the project charter. Yeah, they might have written a bit of it and they tell you to finish it up, put more meat on it and get it done. But, you, but because you're not initiating projects yourself, and you shouldn't, you're not going to be the guy that creates the project charter initially. You might be the person that has to develop it further because the, you know, the sponsor's written it on, the, on a serviette and says, there you go. And then you're the guy that has to really go and flesh it out. To me, this is one of the most important things. You've you got to get that charter as detailed as possible. Um, because it's almost like your one and your first stab at getting it right, a project. There are lots of other uh, principles in, in the PM guides and PM box to say, you know, the charter could be a high-level summary, and then you have to go into the project management plan, and that has to be detailed. But to me, you get one shot at this. If, you get your, if your charter isn't fleshed out enough, you're going to struggle further down the road because you can't really... You can, but it's not, it's not easy to go back and try and fix a charter. Right? So take a long-term approach on this and use it iteratively as well, which means take your time and build a project charter in as much detail as you can. Because the more iterative you are with a project charter, the more new information is uncovered. And the more you can manage risks, you know, stakeholders, uh, the more you work on it, the more it fleshes itself out until it's detailed enough for you as a project manager to take that and start building your management plans and your uh, benefits plans, your scope. Everything really, for me, comes from a, a charter. If you're very process light in your business, and I'm talking about project management process, if it's light, you know what I mean? The company doesn't expect you to, to have a... Um, a fully detailed project management plan. And there are companies there that, that don't operate with uh, very detailed project management plans. Even though you're a project manager, that's fine. But this is the one area you can't get wrong and you can't, you can't, uh, you can't brush over it. All right. So once you, once you have it, you're doing it right, the next thing is it's probably going to change. All right. A signed off project charter can change. Well, all the work you've put in it, you know, three weeks down the line, your uh, the senior leadership says, okay, well, you know what, actually, we want to we wanna add this in there, so this must change as well. You've got to include that in the scope. And then you, then you almost have to go back to recreating it because a little part that you add in it has multiple effects on other areas of it. It happens, so it's not something to get discouraged about. It's not something, it's not a, um, an opportunity for you to think you're, your leadership's crazy and you can't work in this environment anymore. It's not, it happens. You're a, you're a project manager. You, you, have to, you have to work on project charters. All right, so OPM again. We're still talking OPM. So organizational project management really says, does everybody understand what we're doing um, and how we're going to get things done in the organization? What projects are we going to do? How are we going to do it? Um, OPM ensures that you're executing the right projects, right? And that resource allocation that happens in this environment of strategy, operations, um, portfolios, are all the resources allocated correctly for you to implement your strategy? So it's really understanding the whole environment of all the projects together, how they impact on each other, and are they resourced correctly so you can implement it properly. Uh, aspects of OPM uh, improves the capability, performance, uh, and performance of strategy delivery. Uh, it's a foundation for maturing um, the organizational innovation. So the, the better your OPM is, the better you're structured to deliver on projects and strategy, the better, you're in, you're the, the better your organization is to improving and innovating, right? Because they have this capability now of change. And that's what OPM delivers to a business, is to say, if a business wants to make a move on strategy and move this way, they know they can do it easy 
or not as difficult as most of comp competitors might because they have an organizational framework, which is OPM, that can move the business quickly to different areas. That's really what you as project managers do for the business. You, you create that capacity, that capability for the business to change and in, um, implement new things, new ideas. Um, oh yes, the OPM also ensures that it engages all functions in business, all stakeholders, right? Um, in the delivery of strategy. So it really allows every function in the business to have uh, to be integrated and to be sequenced to move the, um, in a certain strategic direction. And resource integration we spoke about. And one important thing, and please um, remember this, is that OPM doesn't replace the management structures in place in a business, right? I am not going to go to a, a buying executive and tell them what to buy. I don't make management decisions. They, they run their functions. And sometimes people do get a bit um, territorial about implementing OPM because they think that somebody like me will now come and run and manage their business for them. And it's very clear that portfolio management does not take over the responsibility of um, line management, right? If you're trading on that ground and you start to see yourself in that area, you must make sure you step away because it's not your place. You cannot replace a management system because then it really becomes chaotic. But the PMO is positioned to, to take full advantage of maximizing that performance. All right? Yes? Um, what did you have said now? In a small company, and, and those lines are a bit fuzzy. For a, uh, what did you just explain that? Uh, what you explain that, but stepping, on stepping the over. Yeah. Oh, you mean it, it might work better if you're a big organization? Yeah, but this in a small company, is yeah. it, does one person wear more than one hat as it were? That's yeah, true. It's very true. Very true. Yeah, I think what really depends is that interaction, and the person that's doing this isn't somebody that's going to walk in and bully people around and force their opinions on others. I think. A lot of this is to do with dynamics of a business, whether you're small or whether it's big. I think it's probably um, the same complexity, right? I don't think it's a different model that works for smaller enterprises and bigger enterprises. So, I, I, look, I, um, I, I, I can't really give you an opinion on that. Unfortunately, all I've really done is work in corporate. Who's, who can answer that question? Is it, is it any different in a smaller... It's like a small organization. You won't, you won't find a PMO in a small organization to start off with. Yeah. And you'll, you'll find that uh, unless it's a project organized organization, typically like you'll see in construction, the normal run of the mill, small and medium business, uh, there would be management taking responsibility for strategic projects and executing it either with service providers, external service providers, or existing staff. Uh, and perhaps this... Have that role clarity. Yeah. And perhaps this function... And nothing says this function can't be the senior guy in charge of the business either, right? If It doesn't have to be called a PMO, but he has to understand organizational project management. An OPM... You can have OPM without a PMO. It just works better when you have a project management office to manage the interactions of everything that goes around in the business. It works better. But as a principle, OPM can stand alone. And, and it could be a, the most senior guy there that has a team of people. Because it, I mean, the framework works the same, right? Whether you have a PMO or not, PMO helps, helps it along. Especially in larger, more complex organizations where there's a lot of you know, there's a lot of distance between what's happening on this side and that side of the business. In a smaller environment, you probably, like Tian says, you probably won't find a dedicated head of a project, for example. But it's not to say it can't happen. Business is dynamic. Everyone has a different uh, way of doing things. Uh, yeah, one of the biggest challenges is, is marrying the, the new projects with the 8 to 5 responsibilities 
that's why you find people working 14, 15 hours a day um, because they actually uh, being innovative and driving change through the day and they're doing emails at night. Mm -hmm. <coughs> you get very quickly stuck into business as usual, even as a project manager, I can tell you. It's a... It's yeah. Yeah. All right, so um, another gold nugget there, don't go light. And I know that's spelled light, but that's like cost light. Don't go light, <laughs> don't go light on stakeholder identification, even when you're working with small groups of internal stakeholders, right? I think what, what, where stakeholder identification comes um, kind of naturally to people that work in the same environment with the same amount of people every day, day in and out, but projects are unique, and we do, we do sometimes miss that. That Every project, you do, it should be unique, because that's the definition of it, right? And every project, because it's unique, will have a different set of stakeholders, even though you might think that it doesn't. I've messed up on this a few times in, um, in the last few years, where, where I'm, I'm so hell-bent on making sure that I understand that this is the way the project must be implemented, and these are the people that are doing it. If you don't do enough analysis around this, um, you're going to miss people off and it's going to hurt your project. Maybe not immediately, but by the time somebody has to sign an invoice for you and they've got no, no <laughs> clue about what this project is, it's, you're going to get delayed. Don't go, don't skim over it. Stakeholders, the project charter, very important aspects of starting, initiating projects, implementing them. Okay, so now what I'll do is just show you quickly about how these life cycles work in, in JET. Um, you know, it's very unique to our business. When we start developing the strategy, we've been through that. You've got a good view of how that happens in, in our business. Uh, we do an analysis, so the strategy is here. And the current view is here, what is the gap? What really has to happen to get to the, the new business as usual? Um, that's where we start developing that feasibility we went through. Already, it happens quite early. I said, you know, you don't want to do a feasibility after you've invested so much time in trying to develop a strategy. You do it soon. You do it quick. You know if it's worth it or not. If it's not, you kill it off. Um, what we like to do in our business a lot is prototyping and piloting. Because you're always, pro you're always probing the market, right? You're always probing what customers are reacting to, what they're doing, what's you know, what will work. So you do small scale. After the feasibility is uh, developed and you think you've got a good idea, you do it small scale and you start taking reads on these things, right? If the reads are good, you develop the business case to say, and then you've got more meat to develop that business case to say, yes, we've tried it, it works, looks like a good idea. Or we tried it, you know, the reaction ain't as great as we thought, so let's, let's try the next one. Um, obviously, it happens in a much more organized way than what I've explained it, but um, that's the process that follows. If it passes uh, prototyping, a small-scale testing, it goes into a business case. That business case is presented to our EdCon DevCo, the development committee. They decide if they're going to put money into it or not. Let's say it gets approved, it goes on to procurement. So a lot of our projects we do have to be, we don't build things ourselves, we're a retailer, we sell clothes. Other people have to build stores for us. Other people have to develop systems for us. We go through a rigorous procurement uh, process. That's outside of the project. That sits in corporate, and they help us through that. Um, good people, it works great. And you're usually getting uh, the best um, value for money if you're using a procurement. But it passes through that stage. Um, and then in there, there's the full-scale rollout with all the different projects technical project management people doing these kind of projects. I mean, already they involved over here in point four. Um, but the full-scale rollout is a stage that a, pro a project follows in our business. And then uh, you start doing your monitoring and controlling, right? So that's the, where the monitoring comes into play. I'll show you a little bit just now about dashboards we use. Um, but that is a stage where it's in play now. It's been executed. You have to keep a close eye on if it's really working the way you want it. And then that's where the benefits management plan comes into play. Um, and usually, 
it's handed over to business or to some functional area that has to get value out of it. Simple process. I mean, this, 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 uh, all, most of this, like I say, happens in spaces of a year. We have some other long-term strategies that we work on, which have a longer time horizon, but everything we do in that year is still focused on where you want to be in five years. So there might be stages that you, that you get to those five-year plans. That's, our, that's the stages we follow in JET. Any questions around that? Yeah. So in our sense, fashion and um, keeping up with trends and um, being, you know, making sure you have the most fashionable product is business as usual. Because as a, as a fashion retailer, you have a trends department that works in buying that already takes a read on um, what trends are overseas. You know, in, so the winter trends there will become next year's winter trends in South Africa, for example. So, so a lot of that, what you're thinking is a fashion is a fast-moving thing and it changes and you have to keep your eyes on the ground. Already the buying area, for them, that's business as usual. Yeah. So we never really go and get involved in trends. So a good example of what a project we would probably do when it comes to buying is to implement AI. Yeah. In their planning, they would need a planning tool and it has to have some sort of computer learning. That's where our um, PMO would get involved and say, okay, this is how we set it up for you. Structures are working here, you need these specialists. But that's not business as usual for them. They have AI in planning, for example. But it is to read fashion trends. All right. Any other? If your projects are not approved, what do you do? Do they go back into a strategy development? Do they just get canned? How, how do you manage that cycle? So luckily, what I said earlier was that there's lots of alignment, close alignment with corporate and with business units on what, so by the time you get to this business case and feasibility, um, that strategy development, already part of that, the chief executive has spoken to the CEO. You know, he's not going to present something brand new to the guy and say, in that DEFCO meeting and say, this is where we're going. So nine out of 10 um, programs and projects pass from five to six, or from six, from, yeah. Informally for an Yeah. It's never a surprise when it lands up in Jeff. No. But 90% it, it, uh, goes from six to seven unless something has really been missed, and that happens. I mean, it's business. You can miss stuff. Why does human control stick nine? Do you apply the So the PMS system is really focused on our people side, right? For projects, we, uh, we use the feasibilities and the um, benefits management plans to measure the, or to, to implement the monitoring controlling piece. Um, yeah, so I think really what we're measuring here is how does this tie back to these KPIs? So whatever KPIs we've developed there, that's the um, that's where we're going to declare we're going to declare success, or you know during this process it's always going to be does it prove the business case all the time? 
it's um, <clears throat> that's why I say when you're developing the charter, that's where you almost, or I know it's early uh, in the process, but I think that's where the best value is. When you develop the charter, you already say it has to it has to perform this way to to be declared a success, right? Those measurement criteria you build into uh, the monitoring and controlling. And it's also, um, where it's good is that if, let's say a project's not performing the way you want to, right? There's a tendency that companies put more money into it at this stage, right? And then it's, you know, it, it's almost like a, a backstop for that happening, that if, if it's not reaching the measures that you asked for in the beginning with a business case, you know, it's, you can, you can try different things, but don't put more money into it. They invest more into it if it's not forming, performing to that business case. And that, that's pretty much where that's, that stops you. And then it's, it's a bit of a reality check to say, don't carry on putting extra effort into this. It's not, it's not doing what you want. Worst thing is just to keep on rolling with stuff that it's probably, you know, you're going down the wrong path. Too much time invested in stuff. Luckily, that doesn't happen very much with us because the process is robust enough for us to know, you know. And, and everybody understands how the process works that has to implement these things. Even the ex-co's, the functional managers, they know how the process works. So it happens pretty smoothly. project, you know, if it's, it's run-of-the-mill project, stuff that you've learned over time how to do well, it's a lot yeah. more smoother compared to a completely new innovation that you new uh, approach that you're taking. Most of our projects are... It's all about the uncertainty. Yeah, most of our projects are where we've, we've got people that can do them well. We've got skilled people that can put the stuff in place. Some of them are new ground for us. I mean, it's not... Uh, New, it's new knowledge that we're building as well. But yes, it's, it's, it's a formula that works well. Implementation is like a, it's, you know, you can compare it to a well-oiled machine. It just, that's what you want to do, that's how you implement it. Everybody understands and works with that process. Every business needs one of these, I think, because how do you take things through stages? You know, you can't have it haphazard, you can't change your your methodologies from one year to the next. I guess you could, but it makes implementation very difficult. You have to coordinate things differently, right? So, milestone planning, that's where we really get involved a lot in, in, in our project management office. We are, um, we're, we're, there's just not enough of us in the project management office to manage the, the minute execution detail. and. You know, to be honest, I don't think anybody expects that from a PMO anyway. You're there to support project managers, and one of the best ways to align strategic projects with certain functional project managers that have to implement a lot of this work is to put a lot of time and effort into milestone planning. That helps the project managers as well to know, although they have most of the input into creating milestones for strategic projects, it helps them commit almost to say, you know what, these are the deliverables of the project. I can do this in six months, I can do that in three weeks. Then from there, the milestones are almost built up for every one of these strategic projects. With the project managers, they do, they do the, the milestone planning with the PMO. But the PMO cannot manage the actual tasks and activities in between those milestones. It's, it's pointless. We will never... We'll never get that amount of aggregating amount of information up to a PMO, and that, that's also something we want to avoid. We, know we, don't want to, we don't want to be the kind of PMO that forces uh, project managers to report minute detail up to a PMO. We have to try and sort out and aggregate that information, and then you know, we, we're not just the guys that are going to take that information and make it ours and report it to Exco because it's not, it's not the way things operate. So to avoid that kind of um, way of work is where you put all your time and effort into at the beginning of a project, very early in it, is that planning phase where you're doing your milestones. And then you're going to put it onto um, whatever system you use. We use MSP. It's pretty, pretty easy to use. 
I mean, Microsoft projects. Almost like Excel, but not. So we, we use that to manage those big milestones. And then uh, we use those steer codes and the reviews to, to update those milestones and call out risks and make course correct. All right, so you cannot, uh, you cannot step light on, on milestone planning at, at our level. Detailed task planning, I, I can't do for, I can't do it with the PMs. They know, they know what they're doing, they know how to get things done, and that's where they operate. All right. Um, holding frequent reviews during those milestones I spoke about. You have to keep track of where these things are heading. This is a nice example of a dashboard that we use. Now this gets implemented in that uh, monitoring and controlling phase of our projects. Um, it really enhances communication, and it, it's if you have the right skill of skill set of people and how to use a system, they can update this with a button, right? Um, and it really pulls up from data that gets aggregated from a um, sales system, or you know, project managers are inputting things into um, Microsoft projects. So it's easy to build one of these. It's it's very it shows a very graphical um, view on progress of a project. Nobody reads um, anymore. Well, let me qualify that. If there are a thousand things that uh, executives have to do in a day, they're not going to read through reports. They don't want to read reports. They want to see. Uh, they want to see a picture of something. You know, they want to see a graphic presentation of something that they can get a summation of the status of a project from five minutes worth of looking at a report. That's how things unfortunately work, or fortunately. Or uh, this, the, no, this we don't actually have any um, special software for dashboards. This is built off uh, PowerPoint and uh, Excel. Simple. I'm going to keep it simple. Uh, no. Microsoft Projects, Excel, PowerPoint. With ThinkCell, a lot of ThinkCell stuff. I mean, that's the standard in um, PowerPoint. This whole dashboard, yeah, like you see, it probably takes five minutes to update, and it's done weekly. But dashboards are very, dashboards are very cool, and um, it's very good to look at. So, you know, if you're presenting a dashboard to a steerco and they say, "Oh, I see you." Doing well in these areas, not so well in those areas. Cool, I'll see you next week. So that's not what they designed for, right? You have to create the dashboard so that you can make a decision based on what you're seeing. It's not, it's not a pretty, uh, it's not just a pretty view on how the pro projects are progressing. Unless you're using it to make a decision based on what you can see in front of you, it's, uh, it's just a cool thing to look at, isn't it? So the real value of dashboards is what, how decisive are you when you when you when something's presented in front of you. Then um, oh the elevator pitch is another little gold nugget. I think you you if you're managing a portfolio or program or project for that matter, you have to be able to give an elevator pitch on the status of a project. That just means a 30-second update to somebody that walks past you and asks you, Ian, how's this uh, project doing? If you cannot give that up-to-date, a 30-second burst of update on what the project is about, then you've, you're probably not close enough to it. I mean, you probably wouldn't know if you're getting it wrong either, would you, if you're not close to it. But the way you manage project portfolios, programs, is you, um, especially if you're not that close to the detailed execution and tasks and activities is that you have to be able to give a very quick update on everything. Um, so if you only have 30 seconds to tell somebody how project's doing, then you're usually going to call out the, the major factors of where they are, right? And always know those things because you will get caught out if you don't know it. And you will look like a fool if you get it wrong. But that just... Shows you have to keep your pulse on the latest way of projects to do. Uh, the PMO role in OPM. Um, 
I'll, I'll shoot through a few of these and maybe just stop me if I'm going to quick. But I want to get to the end um, where, where we talk about setting up PMR. Um, so, the, so we're talking about authority levels, and this might be useful for you if you're really thinking or looking at PMOs. Um, a PMO must have the authority to do things in a business, right? You must have a seat at the table. You cannot be, um, you, can't, you, can't, you kinda can't be in the lower levels of middle management where you have to keep on forcing other people to do things and it's a constant struggle of power and politics to get things done because it's ineffective there. But you have to have the authority to, to align programs and portfolios, right? You have to be able to customize the project practices that you implement. Um, and I'll go through one, each one in a bit more detail just now. Uh, you have to enhance the accountability of projects and the governance of projects. And you have to be able to be at a level where you can get stakeholder buy-in at a high level. You've got to drive the needed change. You have to have the authority to make those decisions. You have to proactively be able to influence how risk is managed. Uh, you've got to be able to manage the, the talent, the project management capabilities of your business. Oh, and you have to be able to optimize, oops, optimize the investment in um, projects, and, well, projects within a portfolio. So just quickly then on, uh, you should have the authority to align. So the first responsibility of a PM, oh, or a project management office is to align um, projects strategically with, well, align projects according to the strategy. I, I don't think I'll, I'll be in a situation, and I hope not, that I would be managing or looking at projects that are no, have got no strategic value. Um, so PMO is, is always making sure that those projects that are getting implemented are always aligned to the, the company strategy. Yeah, especially when functional heads come to you and say, Ian, you know what, we need a, <laughs> I've got a project, can you, can you put one of your project guys, manage this project for me? And it's difficult to say no, but you've got to kind of also understand uh, what a PMO does and what they don't do. Because you're friends with people as well in the executive level, you know, they always ask you, you know, I need help, I need a project manager to do something. You do what you can without messing uh, relationships up, uh, you know, without hurting relationships, but um, most of the time you choose and you're almost presenting on what the projects are that you're doing and those are strategically aligned and not a lot of uh, other projects sneak in there. Okay, the, PM, the PMO must also be able to monitor and adjust the risks based on the opportunities and uh, of, every, of every project, right? And, and that's uh, really understanding that it's not just the technical implementation of projects, but it's really to say, okay, I'm aligning this project or I'm deprioritizing it based on what you can see as a risk or a new opportunity in the business. It's almost like moving the puzzle around. You must have the authority to deprioritize, prioritize projects. Not just look after the technical implementation of projects. Um, you, as a PMO head, a PMO, well, project management office must be able to customize the way projects are done in the business. Right? So you have to have the, the level of authority to say, this is how the life cycle of a project works. These are the tools we use at which stages we use to make sure the projects are implemented. If you can't affect that in the business, then you must understand that you, you don't have that authority or you, you need to you need to make sure that you can get to that level. Um, yeah, this is this is really uh, the steer curves I was talking about because you have to be able to. Um, well, if project manager enhances that, there's accountability. In, in certain areas where there might not be a PMO, nobody's coordinating this, nobody really understands, is it their responsibility? Um, what role do, do I play as a functional manager in this business? A lot of that chaos is almost 
removed from the system because the, the PMO creates that environment where everybody understands their roles, it's integrated properly, what are their um, responsibilities, what are their commitment to projects. So it helps that governance and accountability piece in the business as well. You've got to have the authority to in integrate the roles and practices in the business. Oh, this is another good point. I think the Steer Co. is not a place where you uh, bring new information to the project team, right? Or the, to the X Co. Usually the X Co. is sitting on the Steer, steer Co. Um, it's not good practice to inform stakeholders of issues in a Steer Co. It's good practice to um, meet and, and smooth out issues before you sit in the Steer Co. And it's not the place to call somebody out. Um, or to call out risks or new issues, and definitely not the place for somebody else to call you out as a project manager or PMO um, on, on new risks and issues that you didn't know about. Steer codes are good. Use them where you can. Um, so stay, ensuring you have correct stakeholder buy-in also, it helps avoid um, conflicts where there's, you know, hidden agendas in the system or communications not working. So you have to have the authority to build that stakeholder integration and make sure those people are uh, buying into the strategic project. Uh, what's important here, PMO um, helps organizations adapt to complexity, right? And right, like I was speaking about OPM, uh, organizational project management, it, it almost gives the company or the organization the ability or the confidence to take on new change because it almost, that capability is now built into the system. People are not scared to make changes because they might think they fail because they understand that they have an implementation process that will probably get them to the point they want to be. And more of the focus is placed on the correct strategy and not so much worries about can we implement this strategy. Right? And that's what drives the change in the business as well. And then another little golden nugget, not everybody really cares about your charts and your deadlines. Yeah, I mean, you realize that. Because not everybody in the company is a project manager, unless you're in a consulting business, right? Where people operate as a, a project-tized business. Not everybody's going to buy into your... Um, your plan. It's, it's very important that at some point where you realize you can't get things done because people are not um, interested in your project, you've got to go a level or two higher to understand where that starts from. Because usually it's, it's because there's no collaboration and buy-in from a senior person that um, people you might be working at lower levels don't want to cooperate. It's pointless butting heads with those people, uh, those level of people. We've got to go and collaborate and get the right stakeholders involved at the top, right? Um, you've got to be able to proactively manage the risks. And we spoke about that a bit earlier. PMO has to be able to make decisions around managing risk um, and how to navigate and change projects and portfolios to make sure that those are avoided or built into the OPM. So you have to have the authority. Uh, to be able to change things around where they work, where they work the best. To what extent do you integrate frameworks and skills into your PMO? You take it over almost as it is. Which framework? Sorry? Do, do you have like a standard uh, enterprise wide risk management framework that JET uses or that ECON uh, sort of? Users? We do, at a, yeah, at a governance point of view, we do. We, we've not, um, you know, we've not specifically taken our, our governance framework and applied it to a portfolio management framework. The risks I'm talking more about here are um, where there are problems with implementation or things have suddenly become too expensive to do um, or there's failure in the system somewhere where... Um, yeah, it's project level, um, it's individual project level, and then making sure those are still getting the most benefit for their for the investment. 
All right, managing talent uh, at a PMO level, you have to be able to make a call on developing people, investing in them, making sure that they have the right credentials, the right knowledge, education. Um, so you have to be able to manage talent. Maybe not only in your, MP, uh, in your PMO, but also where you can see there are aspects of the business that might be uh, where the capabilities are lacking on implementation, you must be able to say, okay, guys, this is an area we must invest in. It's strategically important. Um, there's, there's project manager skills required in that level of the business. So you've got to be able to get a good read of how things are working, we, what people are capable of, and direct some kind of talent investment into the areas that you need to. And then lastly, um, Talking about optimizing investment, yeah. The the PMO or whoever's in charge of a PMO or what what they call, they have to be able to be involved in decisions where that create new programs and projects, right? Uh, you have to be involved in the planning of those projects, and that's where I'm talking a lot about the milestones are very important to plan out ahead. So you have to be able to interact at that level, and then uh, you have to be able to set priorities and you have to have the authority to at least advise or recommend that projects get ended before you know, discontinued. Okay, so I've added a bit of agile methodologies in here. I think another good, very good tip is um, I'm also one of those waterfall uh, inclined project managers, but where Agile really helps you is, and where it works great, um, is when you're doing retrospectives and reviews. And reviews are usually done at the end of a phase, or at the end of a project, and it really tells you um, what work have we done, and what's the, what's work, what work is going to happen in the next three months, right? Agile does that. Uh, Traditional project managers probably don't sit and say, end of the phase, review it, and then have a view on what's going to happen. Must you change anything based on what you know? I mean, for those guys in IT development, that Agile is, uh, they don't use anything like I've went through now with the predictive life cycles. But Agile, you can use what works from Agile. Retrospectives work very well. That's where, um, like a review talks about the project, what you've done, and what's the priority going forward. Retrospective. Is more like how, do, how have we worked together in the project? Talks about what uh, other interactions have taken place. Are people still working together properly? Are you a functional team? For, for those in Agile, um, are there anybody that you guys use Agile, right? That aspect of it, I think, is uh, there's a lot of good things in Agile. It's difficult to implement in these kind of organizational uh, projects. But use what you can from Agile. I think it's a very versatile and good way of managing projects. And definitely the reviews and retrospectives. Read up on it. It will help your projects, even in the traditional waterfall uh, methodology. So the key to effectively fitting maturing uh, implementation is a strategically placed PMO. Right, that's what we spoke about. So the last couple of points I'm making is um, setting up a PMO. So this is just a few things we've, uh, we've realized work and don't work. So you've got to have executive buy into it. You have to have somebody that can lead uh, the, the need to have a PMO in your business. It's not something that you're going to walk in and, and suggest straight away. You have to have executive sponsorship. And they are willing to implement it and stay stay with the process, right? Uh, stakeholders and stakeholders. By stakeholders, I mean the people that are going to be affected by an OPM system and a PMO. They have to get buy-in and they have to have input into what it is um, and what it isn't. What is a PMO to them? Like we spoke earlier in the beginning, a PMO is whatever you make and create, and whatever value you want from it is really a PMO. But it it must work strategically, you must implement the OPM. Uh, so definitely get input from those kind of people. Uh, stakeholdership is good, oh, very important. And agree on the type of PMO you want at that stage. Could be 
the, the dashboard PM I was speaking about, it could be the templates, the guys that build the templates and make you fill out certain forms, or it could be the, the directive PMO. But again, it must be, it must be understood what, is, what do the stakeholders want out of this, right? Um, when you're implementing a PMO, treat it as a project. It is actually just a, an, another project, right? So it, it's not something that's going to happen without actually applying project management principles to implement something new because like everything else, if you haven't had one, a PMO is a new uh, change in the business. Um, but allow time to consult widely and make sure you drive it. And don't try and boil the ocean. Uh, regular work still has to happen. So there are certain things with creating a PMO, you're doing it in stages. As the business is ready to, to implement things, you, you're putting new processes in place to create this, this PMO structure. It's not something that happens overnight. And it may steal time away from other work as well, because even <coughs> us, before we created a PMO, we had, a, we had projects to manage as well. We still do. So uh, keep whatever deliverables you have to creating this PMO. Keep it to short bursts as well. Or, you know, don't make it unreasonable time frames that you have to implement things in the business, because this is organizational change that you're talking about. It's not a, it's not a new functional department. It's, it's changing the organization, the way they implement strategy. Um, and very important uh, is you have to prove your worth, not as a PMO office, or not as a uh, PMO structure, but I think also as project managers, you have to prove your worth, right? You have to understand uh, what benefits you're adding to the business. Scary enough, usually when things get cut, they start looking for project managers. And those People with project managers on their title are you the ones that, you know, they're going to keep a buyer, they're going to keep a store manager. So you have to prove your worth as a project manager or a PMO, because times are tough. Those are usually the things that get cold first, unfortunately. That's just how South African business works, I guess. So, the uh, if you don't have a PMO, at least some kind of it. All you have is chaos, which is interesting for a while until it really isn't anymore. And that's Jim Stewart, some random guy. Thank you. There's some useful articles, and yeah, I think if you want them, you can uh, definitely go into them, check them out. If you want to mail me, you're welcome to email me. If you, if you want to get some more info, just down some ideas, I don't mind. Are there any last questions? Everybody? Uh, Comfortable with the information up there? Dion will uh, find a way to get this uh, presentation out to you if you're interested in having it, I guess. Thank you.